Hello, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 midnight Eastern Time, and 5 a.m. on Saturday in London. Remember the time changed. Uh, we're broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, tonight we have a returning guest, Dr. Adam Dipert, talking about his helium-3 experiment. We'll be back in 6.8 seconds. Dr. Adam Dipert returns not as the space juggler. He's coming back as a scientist running cutting-edge experimental physics involving helium-3. From his dissertation, he says, Presently, I am dealing, um, I am designing and building a squid sensor system with four squids to detect helium-3 signals in a new experiment. This system is part of the Systematic and Operational Studies, or SOS for short, apparatus, which will be installed in the Pulse Star reactor on the North Carolina State Campus. The SOS uses a dilution refrigeration refrigerator to reach temperatures as low as 0.4 Kelvin. The building and commissioning of the cryostat is taking place at the tunnel facility. There's a lot to unpack in just that one paragraph. So many questions. Well, thank you so much for visiting with us again, Dr. Dybert, tell us more about your experiment. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to uh, have the opportunity to share this with you. Um, so I'm part of a national collaboration, and uh, we call it the uh, NEDM, which stands for Neutron Electric Dipole Moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am building kind of a sub system uh, in in the apparatus uh, so that we can um, develop a test bed. The the actual experiment that we're going to be doing is happening at Oak Ridge National Lab, yeah. and uh, it has a really, really large cryostat. A cryostat is a device that we make things cold inside of. And so, um, so yeah, we're kind of building a test bed at NC State University where, um, for example, the cryostat that we're building for Oak Ridge is going to take uh, about three months to w cool down or to wow. warm up. And the one that we're building at NC State will have a lot of the same components or a lot of... Uh, similar components, but uh, we'll be able to warm it up and cool it down in um, a week. And so we'll be able to wow. test things. So that's why we call it the systematic and operational studies apparatus. Okay, okay. awesome. And just just to give people a feel for it, what happens at 0.4 degrees Kelvin? I mean, what what things, ha what happens to physics? What happens, yeah, I mean, what, <laughs> what about cold. that helps you with your experiment too? Oh, good yeah. question. Yeah, so pretty much everything is a solid at that temperature, just about everything, except for helium. Uh, helium can be a liquid uh, down to very, very low temperatures and very high pressures. Um, so just to kind of like give a scale, um, you can think about like room temperature, right? 70 Fahrenheit or something like that. That's at about 300 Kelvin or, or 293 um, zero degrees uh, Celsius, right, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit is 273 degrees Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And then we drop down 200 degrees down to 77 Kelvin, and that's where we get liquid helium. Mm -hmm. Then we keep drop, or I'm sorry, that's where we get liquid nitrogen. Uh, then we drop yeah. down a little bit further and we get to 4.2 Kelvin, and that's where we get liquid helium. Then we go down a little bit further and you get to 2.7 Kelvin. And do you know what that's the temperature of? Mm. 2.7. No. Uh, Cosmic microwave background radiation. Oh, so yeah. okay. I've heard that. I just didn't remember. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Generally in space, if you're far away from a star, then you know your equilibrium temperature will arrive at 2.7 Kelvin. So for example, right, like the um, web tapes, the web uh, telescope, like the panels are designed to be that temperature in order mm -hmm. for it to reflect uh, and for their, uh, you know, functions to work properly to analyze what they're seeing. So uh, outer space generally you can think is 2.7 Kelvin as long as you're far oh. away from the star. And then um, 
and then uh, we can so you keep cooling down when you get to uh, 2.2 Kelvin. That's when you have the uh, super uh, fluid transition for helium. So it enters a different state of matter. It, it no longer acts like a liquid. Um, mm. It's more subtle than that, but it's also very sharp and very special. And then you can keep going down from there. Um, and uh, as you get to lower temperatures, then it's like as helium does the transition from being a normal fluid into being a superconduct or a super fluid, um, mm -hmm. it has a really sharp spike in um, some of its its uh, qualities, like the um, specific heat. Um, but really, what ends up happening is that it stops. Um, uh, it stops having um, resistance when you try to move things through it, and oh. it stops absorbing heat in the same way uh, as a normal fluid does. Oh. And so, uh, and, th and there are some things like um, you might have heard of um, Johnson noise or Nyquist noise or things like this. These are noises inside of um, electronics or noises inside of me metallic materials. Um, a lot of those things that the amount of noise in the system will start to drop as the temperature gets even lower and so um so like a lot of interesting qualities occur at these really low temperatures and in our experiment we basically end up having a, a what we call a cell so it's just an enclosed volume and we fill it up with superfluid helium uh, so it's got helium-4, right? Um, w normally, if you just say helium, um, you're talking about helium-4, meaning it, it's a type of atom that has two protons and two neutrons in it, right? And um, and so when you have that helium-4 and it's inside of there, uh, it ends up being this, uh, this bo box filled with superfluid. And then when you put other atoms into it, because it the superfluid doesn't have viscosity, those atoms can move inside of the cell um, without being deflected by the helium-4 atoms. And in that way, we call it a mechanical vacuum because the helium-3, when we put that in the cell, can just move nice and smoothly from one side of the cell to the other unless it runs into a helium-3 atom. Um, but we keep the, the densities low enough that uh, the size of the box is equal to the um, mean free path of the particles. and wow. um, and so then, yeah, we also put neutrons inside, the, or we're going to be putting neutrons inside of these uh, containers. And the idea is that then the, the helium ends up doing like a lot of different jobs for us at the same time. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that was too much to say all in one mouthful. Every one of those sentences I, I could speak for another hour about. So, so. Wow. Uh, thanks. thanks for joining us, uh, Cliff. Really appreciate you being here. Yeah, I'm I'm completely fascinated. I can't wait to hear more. Mm -hmm. So, and and I remember we talked before. It was uh, what was the deal? Was uh, the whole antimatter and trying to figure out why there wasn't as much of it as some other things? Is this like in general terms? What's the overall idea of what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish with all of that? <laughs> oh wait! Yeah, I all right, David. We're gonna, we're yeah. I'll, I'll try to say say some things in a way that make make a little more sense. Sorry, I I uh, went a little deep there right at the beginning. Um, so yeah, um, there are reasons that we're doing these experiments, and it's not just because we like to hang out in laboratories and mess around with cool electronics um, and, you know, make things really cool. But that is one of the reasons that we do it. Okay. Um, you have to be that type of person who just loves that in order to tolerate this type of work. Um, so, uh, so you, y'all have probably heard of the big, big bang, right? And yes. um, there's some reasons that a big bang is a convincing argument. And there are some reasons that it's not a convincing argument. Um, and so if you share this slide um, that I, I have on my share screen, then yes. we can get a little graphic of, of what I'm talking about. So um, things that we have observed that convince us that a Big Bang happened are things like the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation and its uniformity. So this is all the way on the left side of the screen. The reason this is amazing is because uh, those this is a map of the temperatures of space, uh, and this is the temperature of the light in space. 
and it's fairly uniform in every direction, like really exceptionally uniform in every direction, even though if the speed of light is the limit for how quickly information can get from one place to another, there's no way that things on, you know, one side of us and the other side of us, which are just now having their first moment of information possibly being transferred between them, could have arrived at the same temperature like this. So that's why the cosmic microwave background radiation convinces us that the universe could have been a lot smaller previously. Another uh, thing that we observe is redshift. Um, so the further away that galaxies or stars are from us, particularly galaxies, um, then the further away space is, or the, the more space is expanding between us and them, and um, entire galaxies are shifted in color. So, so like purples become blues and blues become greens. And so even though, for example, something in that galaxy, if you were right next to it, might look yellow, when we're so far away from it and it's moving away from us, that color shifts and we actually see orange. And so this is related to the Hubble constant. And um, and so this is what gives us this information about inflation and that the universe is currently expanding. And then uh, there's a, a, a thing called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. And this is a fancy way of saying how many atoms of which type do you get if a Big Bang happened? And uh, what we would say is that the abundance of small atoms is consistent with a Big Bang having occurred. And so that's like the amount of hydrogen and helium and lithium that we see out in stars and, and you know, nebulae and all of that kind of stuff um, is consistent with a Big Bang uh, having happened. And so these three pieces of data are, are huge, you know, and we've worked really hard to be able to collect these pieces of data. Um, and, and all of them are consistent with the possibility that a Big Bang happened. But um, if physics at the Big Bang were, was consistent with how physics is now, which we do think that statement is true, um, then we are missing something called antimatter um, in equal amounts to the matter that we see in the universe. So if you have a particle physics experiment like at an accelerator, for, for example, CERN or whatever, you know, they're running protons into each other at high speeds, and then matter and antimatter and neutrinos and all of these things come out of that collision. And matter and antimatter generally are produced in equal amounts. There's a very small number of examples where they're not produced in equal amounts. Um, but if a Big Bang happened, then we'd expect them to have been produced in equal amounts. And uh, we don't see as much ma antimatter in the universe as we see matter. And we call that the baryon asymmetry. And so um, studying the neutron electric dipole moment and uh, the possibility that this is a, quali a quantity that exists, um, gives us a, a sneak peek into some of the subtle physical phenomenon which may result in antimatter um, living in a different way than matter does, that over time it experiences something different than what matter experiences. And so, um, so it's like a pretty big problem with the Big Bang theory. Um, and I hope I, yeah, <laughs> I hope that made some sense. <laughs> Wow, that that's amazing, and it's like so. How would that even happen? I mean, we we really don't even know. I think, right? Isn't that what what the deal well, is? I think you're trying to <laughs> solve either that or at least a piece of that, right? Yeah. So, um, in physics, there is something uh, that we call the three fundamental symmetries, and um, these are charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. Charge conjugation just means if you take all the matter and you switch it with antimatter, it should act the same. Parity means just like which way your uh, reference frame is, right? Like literally the way that you're measuring it shouldn't matter. And then time reversal says in quantum mechanical things, you can run them forward or backward in time, and it should all work fine in both ways, right? On a quantum mechanical level, right? Of course, eggs don't uncrack, but... Um, but, uh, you know, when an atom or when a, um, you know, a particle breaks up, like a particle that can break up, breaks up, then you can also take all those constituent parts, put them back together, and they become that particle again. So that's an example of things going forward and backward in time. Um, wow, that's amazing. And, 
Yeah, yeah, it is. It's incredible. And we <laughs> um, have evidence um, that these are are like very closely followed by nature, like a lot of the time. But then we've observed violations of charge conjugation and parity, but we haven't read um, or we haven't observed um, any uh, any specific examples that demonstrate a violation of this time reversal process. And so if the neutron has an electric dipole moment, then that demonstrates time reversal, just like um, David is writing that right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna have to watch the show over and over again just to kind of catch on to what yeah and maybe do a little research too. Yeah. Oh as thank you, David. As excellent um, and welcome. And, yeah, and I I was right. gonna say just in, in reference to David's comment, um so this observation or if we observe some time reversal violating process, mm. that doesn't um, observing that or not does not mean that the Big Bang didn't occur. It just, uh, like, you using the model of the Big Bang that we have right now, we need something like this to be figured out because it is a glaring problem in mm. the Big Bang model. And that's how things, you know, we, we come to understand things better. And in fact, they change. I mean, you know, once upon a time, we thought everything revolved around the earth. And then we realized, no, that's not true. Tire reversal. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, David. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, um, and Cliff had a question. Um, he wants to play this at his astronomy club. It's okay with okay me. Okay by me. <laughs> Adam, is this okay by me? Yeah. Okay. There you go, Cliff. There you go, Cliff. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we want to get this uh, information out to as many people. It is very interesting. You know, we've got more people signing up to see this from our meetups than any other presentation we've we've you know added to meetup yeah. before. So, thank you so much. Maybe we'll bring some more pretty you know pretty in interesting, informative, and and kind of more intense science if that's what people like. I mean, it's really about what we can do to help our audience at this point. So, yeah. yeah. Um. Another question coming back just to the paragraph that I <laughs> that I read because there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, dilution refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now I'm familiar with you know decreasing the pressure of something to chill it. Sounds similar, but so what is a dilution refrigerator? Good question. Yeah, so a uh, dilution refrigerator um, is a device that takes um, helium and helium-3 uh, through kind of a, a system. And, um, and using it, you can cool things down to really low temperatures. I think the lowest that I've seen is like five millikelvin. So that's 0 0.005 Kelvin. Um, but wow. it is, um, there's no theoretical limit to how cold it can get, um, but it's, it's a very, uh, demanding technical challenge in order to build one of these devices. And so basically it's, um, it's like you have a volume that has liquid helium inside of it. So remember liquid helium, 4.2 Kelvin, right. then you have some fiberglass or something that, um, is not well thermally connected to the liquid helium. Um, mm -hmm. and you have a little volume inside of there and you let your liquid helium drip down into that little volume. And, uh, have you ever seen when you take water and you put it inside of a vacuum chamber and you pump it and then the water starts to boil. Boil, and, yeah. And then do you know what happens after it boils? Well, it's vapor, but... Mm, tell us. It freezes. When you get the pressure low enough, water at room temperature can freeze. Mm. Right. And so okay. you can make... Um, so in that same way, this little uh, volume inside of the... the um, delusion refrigerator, you have the helium dripping in there and then you're pumping on it and you can make the temperature of the liquid helium drop down to about 1.6 Kelvin. Oh. Then you have an, another volume below that um, and uh, you let your uh, a different amount of helium kind of go down inside of there and it's a cylinder to be clear. So you're talking about a cylinder and let's say you have um, a bunch of helium four sitting inside of there, and then you start introducing helium-3 to it. 
Now, helium-3 is an atom that has two protons and one neutron, okay, and it becomes a liquid, and what you end up with is a layer of liquid helium-4 on the bottom, and then liquid helium-3 sitting on top of it, and we call those the he helium-4 rich and helium-3 rich layers, and then you have a tube coming out of the bottom of that going up to another pumping volume, and uh, when you pump on that um, what ends up happening is that the, the helium-4 is at the bottom where your tube came out, and so whatever is going on inside of the helium-4 is what ends up interacting with the pumping. Um, now, the yeah. helium-4 at these temperatures prefers to have a certain amount of helium-3 inside of it, so mm. it'll be something like 6% helium-3 or so. But the helium-3 vapor pressure is higher than the helium-4 vapor pressure, so when you pump on this, you pump out the helium-3 rather than pumping out the helium-4, and then that helium-3 rich layer lets helium atoms move down inside of the helium-4 layer, and that process is an endothermic reaction, and that's when the heat gets sucked out, is when yeah. the helium moves from the helium-3 rich to the helium-4 rich layer. And uh, that's your five-minute version of how a dilution refrigerator works. Okay. Uh. That's completely fascinating oh my god we could spend hours talking about this <laughs> yeah it's, it's a pretty neat um it's a pretty neat process and a pretty neat device um to work with and yeah let's see here i was just trying to if you um want to share my sure. screen, screen actually i can yeah so this is a picture for example of kind of a close-up of some of the components inside of the dilution refrigerator. Um, this volume right here is is what uh, is is the one that gets down to 1.5 Kelvin. And so that's a um, what we call a, a 1K pot. Um, and then <laughs> this volume here is the one that you do the pumping on the, the helium-4 um, layer with. Wow. Um, yeah, and actually, if you want to stop sharing for a moment. Sure. Um, I will. This is fascinating to see actual hardware that's that's involved with all of this. Yeah, that's the really cool thing about doing it is um, there's actually stuff to do. <laughs> you know, it's not just um, imaginary. Yeah, uh, yeah got it. And and yeah, we we are actually like hanging out in a lab uh, making this happen. And so yeah, I'm having trouble finding like a full picture of where all the action is. But if you share my my screen one more time, here you. Sure. Can see a couple of components all in a row. Okay, uh, I'll share a screen. Why don't we, yeah, okay, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so let's this look one at this and then we'll, we'll address Dave's um, thoughts. Okay, yeah, this one at the top. So this is um, the 1K pot again, and then we have some heat exchangers here. Um, this is what we call the still, that's where the pumping happens. And then down below these heat exchangers, all these coils are heat exchangers, meaning gas uh, coming up is colder and gas going down is warmer and so they reach the same temperature as they're passing each other um, so it's kind of a fancy way of making sure that you optimize uh heat exchange oh and, cool uh yeah so to a, give lot you a, of, a lot of that stuff seems very familiar in terms of i mean actually you know people have used stills for forever because they make alcohol with them so so a lot of that seems kind of familiar is that you know where you're getting some of this stuff from. i mean you know heat exchangers that's pretty typical kind of thing in the world um i don't know i mean <laughs> just yeah, or is so this like so specialized it's completely different than anything it's not the words you're using sound familiar to me so mm -hmm. yeah and of course everything comes back to alcohol on some level right but uh <laughs> oh the, uh... okay <laughs> no that was just a joke um yeah <laughs> we fine. That dilution refrigerator that I showed you a picture of, that was um, purchased by Leiden Cryogenics, and they're a, a, um, a company in Leiden, Netherlands, and uh, okay. that guy is just a really exceptional dilution refrigerator builder, And uh, but we also have some people in our collaboration who have designed and built some of their own, because wow. uh, like we need a, a non-magnetic dilution refrigerator for our, our experiment at Oak Ridge, um, so they... Mm. Yeah, so some folks have designed that. Okay, yeah. well, let's find out what David's got in mind. Um, 25 tons of helium-3. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, helium-3 is very important. Mm -hmm. Not just for your experiments, but... No, yeah. 
should should we ever get fusion to work yeah really <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so that's funny i um you know i don't have some perfect explanation i haven't thought about like exactly why there is such an asymmetry in the abundance of helium three on the earth and on the moon other than you know some things i could say about that are that um in naturally occurring helium like the kind that just you find in um, caverns and stuff like that that'll usually have be one part in a million helium three um, yeah. so there is helium three in there that you can get um, a lot of the helium three that you would purchase which it's um, more ex it, helium three is more expensive per atom than gold um, so it's like it's pretty yeah pretty fancy stuff uh, even though it's a gas and can just go away super fast um, but you know part of it is helium is super light and it floats and so um, if you have helium three then just like helium you know as soon as it reaches atmosphere it just shoots to the top of our atmosphere um, right. but most of the helium three that you would purchase in order to use in a scientific experiment comes from um, nuclear fuel rod uh, you know burn off that kind of the the small atoms that are emitted um, during uh, the breakdown of the, um, you know, nuclear uh -huh. uh, okay. atoms end up producing helium-3, and so they collect that, and then uh, they sell it to us. Oh, interesting. I did not yeah. know that. So what was uh, Cliff saying? I, I missed it. Oh, just like in, a, in an air conditioner system. He was what, the heat exchanger? The yeah. heat exchanger, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. The dilution refrigerator has a lot of similarities to a refrigerator. Yeah. Cool just taken to another level. Um, and then David, it's 4.30 PM. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I said, yep. <laughs> and then oh, Joshua, welcome. Um, welcome back. has a question, um, kind of a little bit off topic, but why do galaxies rotate, which, Ooh. um, angular momentum. I mean, when things fall toward each other, they rarely, head directly toward each other and are more likely to near miss. And if they grab each other, then they're spinning around each other. The more things that do that, the the more spin you get. Mm -hmm. but, but I find it very interesting that the galaxy has the shape that it does because of, well, and I call it the mass anomaly, but a lot of people will talk about dark matter. A lot of what is in the universe uh, composed of quote matter isn't actually something we know what it is. But if you didn't have it there, the galaxies wouldn't look like that. So anyway, uh, topic for another day. Thank you, Kishore. I really appreciate you being here and asking your questions. And uh, I, we'll look into some stuff for you like that. So the questions that people ask are, are, would make great topics for our show, I think. Don't yeah. you think? Sure. All right. So uh, yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna show your your website here because I'm very curious now. How did you go from? Because because I think you started in, you know, you you told us about the being a space juggler and you kind of started there. But how did you go from doing that to being a helium three scientist? <laughs> this is just a fascinating thought to me. Like, I go ahead, tell me. <laughs> yeah, actually, I. Um... So after I graduated high school, I ran away to join the circus and I spent four years traveling around the United States and Canada just doing that. Then I got into, my mom convinced me to go to college. Uh, and so I was like, okay, grudgingly, fine, I'll go. And I went and then, um, and actually when I got into multivariable calculus was when I realized that the things that we were talking about in class were the same things that I spend all of my time thinking about, which are objects moving in three dimensions with rotation interacting with other things you know cylinders rolling on cylinders balls rolling on cylinders like uh that's that's what circus is that's what i do and so um so it makes not sense. really that different <laughs> they're not different at all yeah and so i understand physics through that channel of like having done it with my body and um and so I kind of just went along with school because it's interesting. And, you know, I um, have been a fairly undirected person I, in some ways in that, like, I didn't plan on going to graduate school. I just had enough professors take me aside when I was in their office hours because 
I was the kind of guy who was at all of the office hours doing my homework and, you know, getting straight A's that they were like, Adam, you should go to graduate school. This is like, this is the right kind of thing for you. And so, um, so I, I did that and then it just kind of kept, you know, meeting more scientists, figuring out which experiment I wanted. I had a chance to go to CERN, but realized I didn't want to be like the lowliest graduate student in a room of 3000 scientists, you know? Um, and so I had done a little work on this experiment and it was a pretty small team that I would work with directly. It was just like three or four people. Um, but then kind of right outside of that small group, there's like 15 people and then right outside of that group, there's like 40 people. And so it was nice. And it had, it gave me the chance to get my hands on, um, the equipment and, I know how to take apart the entire thing and put it all back together and it works and I know where all the wires go and I, you know, have you, you modified a lot of the computer stuff. programs and <laughs> you mean uh, that dilution refrigerator, you can take that apart and put it back together. Okay. I haven't taken apart the entire oh, okay. dilution refrigerator. I have taken apart parts of the dilution refrigerator okay. and I can remove and install the dilution refrigerator inside of a cryostat and put its pumps on it. And uh, yeah, I guess it's it, it's arbitrary how deep you want to take took it apart. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. I did it's not a pretty pretty complex to me. But it's okay. pretty complex. Yeah. Um, oh, well, oh, we had a. Yeah, just um, David's answering Kishore um, <laughs> there and. Then we have well, Vera, Vera Rubin figured out what well, she was one of the people that figured out what was going on. Oh, hi, Tracy. Lovely seeing you here. <laughs> uh, sure. You're very welcome. Kishore. That's it's great to have you here. And then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did, Tracy. <laughs> but um, okay. all right. Anything else you want to talk to us about, Adam? This has been completely fascinating I, I can't wait to hear more i mean like i said i'm gonna have to replay this and replay this and do a little research i think because yeah it's it's completely fascinating to me and a little over my head <laughs> but that's okay i love i love being in that position to be like confused and going oh how do i to figure things out it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> experience yeah, well, you know, one thing that I think would be fun to to understand for a moment is like, how is it that we do this type of experiment in the sense oh. that, you know, I've said a couple of things about some of the devices or something. Oh. Um, but yeah, if you want to share my screen, oh, then sure. I can yep. um, kind of tell oh, a little yeah. bit about this image that we're seeing here. So, okay. so what you see on the right, this, um, you got this red block coming in through the middle and then above and below that you see the green blocks right and yes. um those squares in, in, on the right image or the rectangles in the left image represent the sample cell so that's where we, we put the um helium four and then that's where we put helium three and then that's where we put neutrons now um all of this is inside of a magnetic field and that uh arrow in the middle that says b0 that's that's what we call a holding field. So it's it's pointed um, from the bottom to the top in this image that we're looking at, right? So what you see is that in both of the cells we have the same magnetic field, and when you have a magnetic field like that, and you have a polarized atom like helium three, you can get it to spin around your magnetic field. And so what we do is we get the neutrons and the helium three to both spin around in the magnetic field. Uh, Wow. Their rate of spinning is dependent upon the, the magnitude of the field. Mm. But then it also can be um, dependent upon the magnitude of an electric field in the region. So that um, mm. red uh, line or that red object is uh, a high voltage electrode and the green objects are, are ground electrodes. And so what we do is we set up an electric field in the top cell that's pointing up an electric field in the bottom cell that's pointing down. And so we have opposite directions for the magnetic and electric field in the lower cell. And we have the same direction in the upper cell. And so we're gonna be performing basically two experiments at the same time mm. using the same materials, uh, but their conditions are slightly different that we expect one for its rate of spinning in relationship to the magnetic and electric field 
to be faster and in the other we expect it to be slower and what's controlling that rate or could be controlling that rate is the possibility of this neutron having an electric dipole moment which would be affected by the electric field more and um and so that's like uh kind of you know really what you know what's the physical experiment that we're doing in order to probe for the neutron uh, electric dipole moment wow and you know i i actually understood more of that i have a degree in electronics so great i've i tried to say at least one sentence that made sense to somebody in this uh in this half an hour well and it makes sense that the one that's because they they're additive and the other one is they're subtractive right because they're they're going two different ways but yeah, it's a, exactly. that's that's brilliant excellent yeah. we had some more thoughts so, I think. so it's kind of like having a control group too oh yeah exactly yeah yep. fascinating all right what do we have um again on the um yes there is a black hole in the middle of the galaxy not yeah. our solar system yeah the galaxy um and <laughs> it's pretty far away <laughs> yeah it's no threat to us because it's spinning around us. It's no more threat to us than the Earth is a threat to the moon. Because we're all spinning around it. I'm sure there are black holes that are closer. To, well, I, I would put my money on there are black holes closer to us than the center of the galaxy. Yeah. Hey, when I lose a sock from the dryer, I swear there are microscopic <laughs> black holes eating them. All right. So what else do we have here? Oh, Cliff is, <laughs> I think, commenting on David's um, dancing. Um, and, Okay. This is interesting. <laughs> Can time reversal exist in nature? Well, I think it was the quantum level that you have to consider, right? Because oh, quantum well, stuff is just well, very interesting and different, and it doesn't quite fit the laws of nature. No, uh, <laughs> time reversal is everywhere. What we're probing for is a violation of time reversal. So the standard is that time reversal is okay. That's, that's the thing. So um, an example of what I mean when I say time reversal would be like a, um, a neutron decay process. So a neutron um, can decay into being a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. Okay. And it's an, it's an anti-neutrino. But the point is um, it breaks up into those three things, a proton, electron, and an anti-neutrino. And if you have a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino all arrive at the same point at the same time, they become a neutron. Okay. Right? So that process can happen forward or backward, and it doesn't matter which direction time is flowing. And so that's what I mean when I say time reversal. Right. Basically, that it, that it could go backward and forward, but not that you're not checking to see whether time in the macro universe actually can go backward and forward. You just that's check. correct. Yeah. Yeah. I can see how the word, you know, like any scientific word taking out taken out of its context and not very directly in relationship to the equations that represent the idea that we're talking about, uh, kind of becomes muddy, right? That <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, we're I'm not talking about back to the future. Um, I'm talking about uh the the lived sort of the lived experience of um of particles and mm -hmm. that that's Great. really the limit of what what time reversal means right hopefully that helps you david let us know if you have any other questions yeah. about that and you're welcome you're Kill very Kishore. welcome Kishore. Awesome. what else um, we have uh matter antimatter oh yeah uh, well that's that's the basis for the experiment right mm -hmm. well yeah <laughs> Actually, then, how does how does time reversal how how does this explain why there's a discrepancy between matter and antimatter? I don't think I quite caught that yet. Yeah, so that is uh, a really complicated question, and I don't have the simple answer for you. Oh, okay. Um, the um, you know, kind of the like try to say it in five sentences. <laughs> way that I could, I could, I, I'd like to try is that um, if the 
neutron has an electric dipole moment, then that is a demonstration of a time reversal violating process. If matter and antimatter evolve in time in different ways, then that also would mean there is a time reversal violating process. And so we are trying to identify some amount of, um, of this type of phenomenon occurring at all because there haven't been any observations of uh, these processes. However, just like the Big Bang where we say, okay, well, there's, you know, cosmic microwave background radiation, there's, um, you know, the red shift, there's the, uh, what else did I say tonight? Abundance of small atoms, you know, all of those are good evidence for, oh, there is, you know, a Big Bang could have happened, but, oh, here's some other evidence that says a Big Bang couldn't have happened, or, you know, it, it our, our observations are not consistent with an a yeah, how do they... having occurred, right? Yeah. Um, so we've observed uh, charge conjugation uh, violation and parity violation, but we still believe that the entire set of symmetries, time reversal, uh, charge conjugation, and parity, we call it CPT, that all of them together are still preserved and symmetric. And so since we've had CMP violation, we're really looking pretty hard to try to find that T violation. Um, mm. And there's there's a number of channels in which people are doing it. And this is one of those channels. Wow. <laughs> Woo. I love it. <laughs> All right. Did we have another thought? Just Oh, thank you, Cliff. Really yeah, glad those you were good questions. Yeah, excellent. All right. Um, so um, I'm thinking we uh, go on with the... Uh, Next bit here, I generally talk about some stellar events coming this week. November 19th through 26th, kind of quiet. Although on November 24th is the weekly space hangout. And they have night sky with the uh, astrophotographer Ian Lauer. On the 25th through the 27th is kind of the Andromeda meteor shower peak. It's after midnight. The moon might be interfering, uh, although it is waning to the last quarter. But there's only five an hour. And that's not very many. It comes from the uh, Biela, the comet tail Biela. So I'm thinking it's not going to be spectacular this time. There is a cool event, though. Um, the Globe at Night has another 10-day segment. And you may remember from a previous show that they uh, have you go out and observe a specific constellation. And you can take pictures of it and uh, pick the chart that it looks like the most in your area. And then they get to understand light pollution. And for the Northern Hemisphere, they're asking you to look at Perseus. And for the Southern Hemisphere, the uh, constellation is Grus. They also announced the 2022 dates. So I'm really looking forward to sharing those with you as well. And then we're back to, like I said, it's very quiet. We're back to Friday and our Friday night show. We're here on Fridays at 9 p.m. Pacific time. And you can see us on the Everyday Spacer Facebook page, as well as the Everyday Spacer YouTube channels. And do watch for time changes. We caught some people out last time. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> I have to get a little bit better at telling you. And I think the next time is in March, right? So, yeah. And we'll spring ahead. So that'll change things. All right. And so a couple ongoing things. There is this Unfold the Universe. And it's uh, where young people can imagine what the Webb Space Telescope might, uh, might show us. And the deadline for submissions is December 18th. Then there's the Design Moon Digging Robots. That's a Lunabotics Junior Contest. And that is sponsored by NASA. You can enter art or you can be a judge. Uh, and if you want to participate, pick one. The winner from each category will be announced on March 29th, 2022. Okay. If you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, science, or astronomy, we'd love to share our live. Join us next Friday night, um, November 26th, Chris and Shane from the Actual Astronomy Podcast. All right. Yeah, those folks are in uh, Canada. So we're going to talk to them next week. And after that, we have Dr. Pamela Gay on December 3rd. And Josh Carlson is going to come back on January 21st. And we're still talking to some people. We're trying to work out dates, that kind of thing. Uh, any last comments we have? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Let's see. Um, David, are the studies you and colleagues are undertaking aligned to the future use 
in mm. spacecraft propulsion or um, or energy source for mankind. Uh, that's really not what we're up to. We're we're trying to, um, you know, find a parameter that hasn't been measured yet. Um, mm -hmm. And there's people have been trying to um, trying to figure this out since the first neutrons were available for research, which was right mm -hmm. after World War II. Um, and we keep getting closer. And uh, there's there's models that say that the precision that we can probe at, which is two orders of magnitude better than any other existing experiment on Earth, oh. um, might provide us with uh, an actual answer. And it might not. And, you know, you just got to remember, if you find what you were looking for, that's fun. And if you don't, that's interesting. Uh -huh. Got it. And Looks like you have a few more yeah, there, too. But just oh. when, <laughs> once you've done your experiment... I'd love to have you back to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I hope you're still doing the show in 10 years. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we might be, who knows? <laughs> okay. Yes. We would love to, uh, to have you back. Uh, all right. So let's see what else you got. Sure, a, a bunch came up, a bunch showed up. Thank you, Kishore. I really yeah. appreciate that. And you're very welcome. Uh, Tracy Ellen. Yep. Yeah. Go watch the replay. <laughs> no singing. <laughs> no. We're just messing with you, Tracy. All of us are. David was messing with her. <laughs> I hope. Um, and Cliff. Oh, Eclipse. Yeah. No, we didn't have good weather here. Was it nice there where you are? Dr. Divert? Did you get to see the, the lunar eclipse? Um, so I <laughs> traveled all day Thursday. And my flights were delayed by two hours, and I didn't arrive until 1.30 in the morning. And then I worked uh, from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And so. then it was yesterday. And when I got home, I was like, oh, man, I'd really like to watch that. <sighs> you know, just, yeah, there, there was no yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were like, well, I, I think it was marine layer here they called it. They were saying the marine layer was going to interfere her. But, yeah, it was. We really couldn't see anything. Is oh, that, man. Was that, and I'm in uh, New Mexico right now, too, where it's like, you know, I can see the Milky Way in town. It's uh, unbelievable. Right. Yeah, oh, my God. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, in New Mexico, you don't have much moisture that doesn't come out of a pipe. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, let's uh, let us let everybody know uh, you are doing stuff with the Space Juggler. And yeah, talk about uh, you've got something coming, right? Isn't there an event you've got going on? Or, or did um, that just happen? Yeah. So what I'd say about Space Juggler. So if you haven't heard about the Space Juggler, then please um, check out the website and YouTube and Facebook. Everything is the Space Juggler. Um, I... In addition to this, I'm obsessed with juggling, and I invented a technique for juggling that will work in weightlessness. Last week, I released a short film that's five minutes long that describes um, this concept in what I hope is a fun way and in a way that I hope is the future of uh, science and math education, at least in part. Um, and yeah, I'm going to have a behind-the-scenes video coming out this week uh, that I'm really excited about. And... Um, then, yeah, more more podcasts that are more focused on that work uh, are on the website and then also uh, will be coming out in the near future. So that's really kind of where my public face has been for the last six months. And awesome. um, I'm not pulling your strings, as, as Pam and Jeff know, when I say I figured out a technique for juggling in space and then I filmed it. Um, I didn't go to space, but I built an apparatus so that I could have realistic physics and... Uh, I hope that you'll enjoy it if you go look for it. So yeah, you know what? You. It's great to make this stuff fun. I mean, that's one of the best ways to invite people in and join us on this fascinating journey that's called science. I I really appreciate that. And if there's something we can do to help, let me know. Oh, you're doing it right now. We're all we're all doing it right now, right? We're hanging well, out yeah. and chatting, chatting yeah, about absolutely. science. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, saw, I saw another one or two. Do we yeah, have a couple? couple. David. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Trust me, there are way smarter people than me. Uh, Yay. Have yeah. them come to our show. Have them come on to our show. <laughs> yeah. 
Did we have one more? Yeah. And then we're gonna then we're gonna wrap it up. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, tell you what, Cliff, you should come and talk to us too. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. You have a wonderful week, and we'll be back. We'll be back. We will be back on Friday. <laughs> And that's uh, December the 26th at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks for joining us.